Welcome to you today. I'm Paul Peppis, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Maya Lin. Her acclaimed work encompasses large-scale environmental installations, intimate studio artworks, architectural works, and memorials. Lin virtually redefined the idea of monument with her first major work, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. And since then, she has gone on to pursue a remarkable career in both art and architecture, always producing artworks committed to the exploration of land, history, language, and time. Lynn gave the Oregon Humanities Center's 2014-15 Colin Rowe Thomas O'Fallon Memorial Lecture in Art and American Culture on November 20th, 2014. Her talk was part of the Connection series. Thank you so much for coming oh, on the thank show. thank you. Your parents were professors. You grew up in a college town like this yeah. one. How did that background and upbringing influence your life and trajectory as an artist? Oh, I think it's framed who I am. I mean, for one thing, um, I, I don't know, it's got to be an ideal way to grow up. So literally, I could be in high school, but I was taking courses at OU. When I was in high school, I was casting bronzes. Um, my dad was dean of fine arts, so it wasn't quite, he was a ceramics professor. So one could say the direct correlation is that, and my mother's a writer, um, so that the direct correlations are that I always tend to write before I make a work. Um, and I sculpt almost everything in clay, plasticine, so that was the father's influence. I don't know, I think, um, I would say you were so much what your parents and your siblings give to you. And though I was bored out of my mind, counted the days to leave OU, Athens, Ohio, I, in retrospect, it was such an idyllic way to grow up. You're a committed environmentalist and your work is consistently focused on environmental concerns. I know from reading about you that your interest in the environment started when you were a child right. in that environment. You want to say a little bit um, about where it came from? You know what, I think that, for one thing, southeastern Ohio is extremely hilly, rural, beautiful. Um, where we lived, our house was actually in a gully surrounded by woods, um, separated by like three streams. So I was out of doors all the time. That's how you grew up. Um, this is the 60s, the environmental movement of the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, um, the public ad campaign with the Native American mm -hmm. crying, mm -hmm. Lake Erie catching on fire. Though obviously it's also a time of the, you know, the Vietnam War, the Civil Rights era. For me as a kid growing up from since, I can't even remember, I really was concerned about what mankind was doing to the environment. And my parents are like, where did we get this kid? But I was out there petitioning to ban steel traps, petitioning to boycott Japan for the whaling industry. So I was always kind of a little bit of an advocate, thought I'd go to Yale and study field zoology. Um, don't know why, just always cared about the environment and was very, very much aware as a kid how much one species impact was having on the entire planet. You work, you do a lot of uh, projects that are in nature, in land, right. in the land. You also have a studio and do a lot of work in urban areas. Right. So how does that go together for you? Well, for one thing, I think in architecture, and again, I've been sort of focused on advocating sustainable design, whether it's energy efficiency or even um, the types of material you use. One of the key things that I really do believe is urban infill projects, so the more we can maintain and not sprawl out, if we can think about our footprint and we can think about the enormous impact we're having, technically our cities, and I think 50% of us live in our cities, is one way. If we can green those and control our growth, we will end up with a much more, shall we say, efficient and kinder, gentler footprint on the world. I mean, one thing, you know, I, you mentioned I'm doing this one big project on the environment called What is Missing, mm -hmm. and part of it is not just raising awareness about what we're losing, but it's also focusing equal attention on what we can do. So there's a whole aspect called green print, which will really study and look at man's ecological footprint. And so, for instance, you know, what can an artist add to the equation, and again, I'm not trying to pretend I'm one of the experts, but if you took the entire world population, seven billion of us, 
and we lived at the density of Manhattan proper, the amount of space we take up is, and I say this at my audience, I'll say it tonight, um, state of Colorado. So is this just a question of population? Hmm. Or is this really a question of land use and resource consumption? Hmm. Tell us a little bit more about the What is Missing project. So it's a multimedia right. project, so could you give us an overview? Yeah, it, um, I always knew uh, I will have done five memorials. I tend as an artist in all my works to work in series, oftentimes odd numbers like three, five. And so for the last 25 years, I've been actually collecting material on the extinction of species, habitat loss, species loss. And knowing that I wanted to end the, the memorial series, so let's say there's one for war, one for civil rights, one for women's rights, one for Native American issues out west, which is confluence. And the fifth and last is the one I call into being. So I set up my own not-for-profit foundation, mm -hmm. and I was commissioned by the California Academy of Sciences to make an artwork. So on their outdoor terraces, east and west, on the western terrace, I made them an artwork. But I used most of the money to also give them the first iteration of what is missing. So it poses the question, what if a memorial could jump form? What if it isn't a static, singular object? But what if it's like water? What if it is, what, it, where, what if it could go wherever it's invited in? The spirit of it is, is it's shared as long as, you know, you know, it's given, it's free as long as you share it. And um, the goal was to create a memorial that in a weird way was fluid in how it could be out there. So it's multiple sites, multiple formats. So there are permanent installations at science institutions. There's temporary exhibits and installs that have gone from China to Copenhagen to parts of the US. It'll exist as a book and a virtual book. And then the nexus of the entire project is the web. So there's a site, whatismissing.net, which I would argue is incredibly wonky. It'll get a little less wonky <laughs> um, this December when we flip it to HTML. But it kind of shares what's going on around the country or around the world, and it invites anyone to add a memory, something they've personally witnessed diminish or disappear, or tell us a conservation story. But it's not just about loss. So as I build this, and I've got about three more years of solid work, we started with, if you could imagine the map in three kind of groupings. The map of the past is called the map of memory. Mm -hmm. It talks about what we've lost. It gives historical accounts from Christopher Columbus as he sails into the Caribbean. He thinks he's run aground. He hasn't. He's run into a sea of green turtles. We have Plato talking about Greece and deforestation. It's one of our early accounts of deforestation. To we ask anyone to give us a memory. Because again, what scientists have decided and call it, um, it's called shifting baselines. Hmm. Jared Diamond refers to it as landscape amnesia. We don't even realize what's missing because with every successive generation, we get used to a diminishment. And that's what we accept as our baseline. So part of the website and the map of memory tries to wake us up to all that we've lost. But again, not to just, not to get you depressed, it's a sense of wonderment. In New York Harbor, lo lobsters were six feet long, oysters were 12 inches in diameter. And sturgeon were so plentiful, they were nicknamed Albany beef, and ships had a hard time navigating the Hudson waterways because they would collide with these unbelievable prehistoric creatures. And, um, and so literally, we want to wake you up and emphasize through the second map, which is the map of the present, mm -hmm. all the conservation that's being done and has been done, and go help these groups. So we've linked over 40 environmental groups, and we will keep linking to more, because we want to kind of link, if you enter a story about grasslands disappearing in the, pr in the prairie states, oh, by the way, these are groups that are working, so help this out. And then the third map will be the map of the future called Greenprint. Let's envision plausible future scenarios. Hmm. So it's, it's kind of, I always play with time in the memorials. This one's a little bit, w let's call it the most dematerialized mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. all of them. But in a funny way, they're all working with the main kind of important political, cultural, social events that we grew up with. And, um, and so even though I call it my last memorial, I'll be donating to this for the rest of my life. <laughs> it seems like it. Yeah, you know, it's kind of a, it doesn't end this one. <laughs> 
in passing, you mentioned that um, the Confluence Project yeah. is a collaboration and a memorialization of Native American peoples. Tell right. us about the Confluence the Project. The Confluence Project started with a long Lewis and Clark's trail coming up to the 200th anniversary of Lewis and Clark, um, their 1806 journey, that every state was doing a commemoration. And the state of Washington, when it got started, said, well, we want to engage with all the Native American tribes along the trail to get them to participate. And when they b were brought in through this foundation called Confluence, um, the tribes had asked if I could be brought on. So there were calls made, and I wasn't really looking at what who was calling, and I'm going, Lewis and Clark, it's not really what I do. I do not do mm -hmm. commemorative man on a horse sculpture, or in this <laughs> case, man in canoe sculptures. And so the then governor of Washington, Gary Watt, called up and said, would you just meet with them? So up, I'll never forget it, um, walked into my loft, um, the tribal elders of the Umatilla, the Nez Perce, the Chinook, and I was like, I understood why they were asking. <laughs> and it was very interesting. They said, well, Lewis and Clark did not come into an undiscovered land. We were here. And we think the way you work with history and memory, that you could tell a deeper history of what this point is. At which point, we've, I've chosen to unfurl along six sites along the Columbia River and its tributaries, six different installations. Some were chosen because they were very important to Lewis and Clark. Others were chosen because they were very sacred spaces to the Native Americans, and still two others were chosen for their ecological significance. Um, the project is under Confluence, is the name of it, and it's really a convergence between ecology, Native American history, um, the Western European, the Lewis and Clark tradition of us being here. And al it's almost like, when do we converge, when do we separate as far as our pathways and we started where Lewis and Clark ended at the Pacific and it's for me the symbolic gesture of that is let's raise a mirror and reflect back mm. but let's look at this history not just in terms of sort of Lewis and Clark arriving at this point but let's mine that history and what if we used Lewis and Clark not so much as a noun Mm. but as a verb. Hmm. What if we could use the writings of Lewis and Clark, which are unbelievably in engaging and interesting. They give us a moment in time. They give us this incredible 200 year moment is what a place was like and who these people were. So that was the start of it. And then um, we're right now working on the fifth and the sixth. It's Chief Timothy, which is the easternmost site, mm -hmm. as well as um, Celilo Falls, which was w arguably one of the most sacred Native American sites. So we'll be creating a piece there that will tell the history of Celilo Falls. So tell us a little bit more about Celilo Falls. So the falls are no longer there. The falls are no longer there. More water flowed over Celilo Falls than flows over Niagara Falls. And they were inundated completely by the last dam, the Dales Dam, to go in on the Columbia River in 1957. And at the time, as I started researching all of um, the, the Confluence Project sites, the tribes that we were working with said, this is too painful a site. Mm. Would you not go here? Mm. And we completely respected that. And in a way, what's engaging and what's been really important to me is with every site we've been invited in by the tribal leaders and, and the tribes of that, of that place. And they've dedicated every site. So for instance, in fact, their interaction with us has actually influenced what the piece would be. Mm -hmm. So for at Cape D Disappointment, you're at the Chinook homelands. And when they, they dedicated the site, exactly 200 years mm -hmm. to the day that Lewis and Clark arrived at Cape D and they recited a poem. And in it, you see, they ask, and the, ref the refrain is always, to nature, teach us and show us the way. That path follows the original water's edge path before they put in a jetty. Meanwhile, Lewis and Clark, whose whole goal was to make it to the Pacific, mm -hmm. 
their way of looking at nature was mile marker by mile marker, north, south, east, west coordinates, very scientific, very analysis. So you have two paths diverging, which at times has happened to very different outlooks on nature that are at this point now parallel at Cape D. Celilo, on the other hand, the most sacred site, we knew that would be the culmination, but if they weren't ready, they th and a few years later, after we had finished Cape D, the Sandy River site, Sacagawea, we were invited back in to work with them because they felt it was time. So there'll be one simple arced bridge that goes along and cantilevers out at a stone jetty. And on it, you will learn the history of Celilo Falls from the geologic time to the mythic time to the time when Lewis and Clark barely made it over the falls and all the tribes were watching because this was again, someone called it the Wall Street of the West because mm. it was so rich because of all the salmon. Um, and then you get to accounts, both Western European, the settlers as well as the tribes and literally by the 50s, by the 40s, as Army Corps decides they're gonna inundate it, what I came across were these incredibly emotional, powerful pleas by the tribes, mm -hmm. please do not do this. And then it ends. That goes two thirds of the way you learn this history. Then it goes silent till the absolute end and we'll find a historical quote that tells you what it sounded like and mm -hmm. what it felt like. And then you'll be left overlooking flat water with only the memory of what, in words, because that's what's left, of, of what this place used to be. Meanwhile, there'll be a pavilion which will have at its core uh, a circular room you can walk into and in it we want to collect the oral histories and also the different Native American tongues and languages talking and maybe it's the name of fish and the different names of the fish. So you can walk into this room that's lit from daylight above and you'll hear the stories of what it used to be like at Celilo Falls. So I think a huge component is just tapping into the memory of what people around still remember what it was like. And we want to capture and collect those stories. That's fantastic, incredible. The collaboration you just described with the Native American tribes sounds crucial for you in understanding and in the evolution of the project. Why is that so important? Uh, because it, uh, we're walking into their homelands. And I think to teach their story, you have to understand whose homeland you're in. And you need to, you don't want to just, I didn't want to create these projects with just a historic viewpoint. So having each tribe engage with us. So like at um, Chief Timothy, the ceremony, the dead, there are always two ceremonies. There's a dedication ceremony at the end but there is another ceremony at the beginning to bless the site. Mm -hmm. And the strange thing is with every single site, as we bless the site, I swear an eagle has flown overhead. It is, and so I said this at one of the ceremonies, and I can't remember which tribal chief said, of course. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Of course. And I'm, of course. So at Chief Timothy, it'll be two stone elliptical, you know, stepped amphitheater steps, and the women faced in one direction, the men faced in the other in this blessing ceremony. The elders shared between, no one could pass behind them. Mm. So the shape of the amphitheater, which will be on top of this island, overlooking and in the river, will commemorate that actual ceremony. So we want to try to say that this isn't just looking at what the tribes were like 200 years ago, this is about their engagement with the project today. Amazing, incredible. Um, you, you've spoken very eloquently about the crucial environmental uh, aspects of your work and mm -hmm. your commitment to environmentalism, but you've also alluded t uh, in your description uh, t of the What is Missing project to uh, use of 21st century tools. Right. So how do you understand the role of science and technology in this environmentalist work that um, you do? I would say in my art, and again, aside from the memorials, I basically would say my life is a tripod. There's the art, the architecture, and the memorials are sort of a hybrid in between. You know, they have a functionality, but the functionality is more of a symbolic import. I love science. In fact, I think I was gonna go into science when I went to college. Um, all my art 
one could argue that like an 18th century, 19th century landscape painter, mm -hmm. I'm an artist who loves revealing the natural world. It's just that in the 21st century, the tools we have to look at the world around us isn't just our own eyes. We can look at sonar views of the ocean floor. We can look at microscopic views of our own bone structure. We can look at topographic terrain above and below sea level. And I mine all that in my artwork is completely obsessed with um, kind of looking at the world around us using science and technology. And for the, you know, the architecture is the other side of me. And I would say I love both and they're very different impulses for me, at least creatively. So, um, and within the architecture, I love urban infill projects. I love projects where if I do work in a rural area, then I've committed myself to making sure that I'm not part of the problem. Mm -hmm. So the site has to be like, the this is one residence we did. The, the clients actually donated most of the land into a nature easement and we kept a very small footprint. So I'm, I'm pretty um, thorough and choosy with when I take on an architecture project. Um, I love working with not-for-profits at time, whether it's a museum of Chinese in America or the Children's Defense Fund, because I feel like design shouldn't just be relegated to, you know, what, what can you say, great budgets. I think mm -hmm. we should be able to bring good design to those that might not even think they could afford it. And I think that's really important to me. Is there a kind of uh, uh, gear changing when you shift from your architecture self to your uh, your artist self, or do they, they engage the same uh, capacities, or is it? No, I think they engage really different capacities. I, I've always said, and it's like a broken record, that the making of art, for me, is like writing a poem. Mm -hmm. It's pure, it's simple, it's pretty raw, it just comes out. If I try to embellish it, it's not going to be as good. Or there's a stripping down, stripping down to keep it to that purity. The architecture is very different. It's like writing a novel. You set up the structure, you have the idea, but it's it's a sentence structure. It's even down to the grammar of one sentence. They all matter. It's, so it's all the little components that will help. So it's, it's almost like you get lost in, and the art of architecture is as much about the love of the detail. And it matters as much down to the doorknobs as it is the bigger picture. It always upsets my architecture friends. They said, well, what do you mean? Ar architecture is an art. I said, no, it isn't art, <laughs> but it's a functional art. <laughs> and I love the fact that it's a functional art. So I love both, but they are tapping into very different creative processes within my whatever my you know like left side right side of the branch. And how do you balance that? that? Do you sort of do the architecture projects sort of come to you, or do you th approach people? With um, them? I basically am extremely fortunate where people call up. I my one goal was to keep my studio. I don't call it an office extremely small so that if I take on a project, I personally take it on. So I like having three to five to maybe eight assistants. Um, missing has kind of gone down the mm -hmm. rabbit hole mm -hmm. as far as help. But and again, we're, we stay small. And I would say that I want to maintain my freedom as an artist to go into my studio and just focus on the work. So for me, um, I don't take on very much. And what I take on, I you know I just will probably focus on it. You'll, you're, it's pretty personal for me. I just like to be. It's pretty one on, and I work with my assistants pretty much one on one, so that they build the work with me. Um, maybe I'm just a terrible delegator. Your studio has been likened to a laboratory. Pretty much. Do you think that's a fair characterization? Laboratory or playpen, <laughs> take your pick. <laughs> I'm ha I get I get to have fun, and I get to explore. And if I get curious, I might have on my hit list of things I just want to look at, and it might take me a decade to get to it. But I just I'm curious, and I just I get to play. Uh, you mentioned playing. I I saw a video uh, where you had been working with um, your daughter's former toys and oh yeah using yeah yeah. Them. <laughs> Uh, just anything yeah. that comes your way. Huh? Well, normally I don't use plastic, but one summer I decided to collect all our garbage and, <laughs> and turn it into artwork. So it was a show called Recycled Landscapes, 
And um, I have two girls, so I collected all their broken toys, and I glued them all together, and then I got very curious, like, well, I'm gonna go to some of my friends who have only boys, and I'm gonna mm. collect their broken toys. Mm. So I have these two asteroids, because it's, again, it's a series. I started with like broken glass asteroids. And so this is the only time I've worked with like non-natural materials. It's called Boys Versus Girls. Mm. And it's so embarrassing because before I had kids, I would say it's nurture over nature. And I'm mm. looking at my girls' toys. They are pink. Mm -hmm. They are, you, you can, and then there's the boys. It's dark, it's blue, it's, it's guns. It, it, it was pretty funny as far as a little experiment. But yeah, that was part of a summer of how much garbage do we generate? So you're, a lot. you're highly acclaimed, awarded. You've just gotten the Gish Prize. But you're also an artist, as you described, yeah. who works very much uh, on, you know, yourself, your small staff. Right. Do you find it difficult to manage the public attention that comes with the kind of success that you've had? I've never really managed it. I basically do the duck and cover. I believe that my art is public. I'm not. When a, po when a project goes online, I'll do an interview here or there, but I basically don't believe, and I'm fortunate because in the profession we're in, we're not celebrities. We don't have to be celebrities. The work can go out there and become extremely public, and we can maintain a nice realm of privacy, and that, I don't think I could do it otherwise. So I was gonna ask you at that point, um, how do you manage to be a mom? and be an artist at the same time. My wife is also an artist and she's also a mom. How do you manage that? I think that's pretty, I mean, being a mom is, is like being a dad. It's just a lot of work at times, fun at times. Um, I think your kids are born and you know that you'll be worried about them forever. I mean, there's something, it's not like you can just put one of them, it's, it's like they're, they're in your charge and I think I think the goal is to step back enough to let them be, mm. um, but at the same time to parent them. It's hard. I, th I think we, I, you know, it's like you, what did I do? I appreciated my parents a lot more after I had uh, kids. We all you do. Know? <laughs> I know. Um, do they, what do they think about having a mom who's a celebrated artist? I think they're probably like every other kid. They're embarrassed. Yeah, yeah they're embarrassed. <laughs> okay, well. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to speak oh, with us today. Welcome. It was a great conversation, and um, we're looking forward to s hearing your talk this afternoon uh, and uh, learning more about the work as it develops. Good luck on the Confluence Project and uh, What is Missing Project. Thank you very much. I've been speaking with artist and designer Maya Lin. She gave the 2014-15 O'Fallon Memorial Lecture in Art and American Culture on November 20th, 2014. Join me next time when I speak with Michael Hames Garcia, the new director of the Center for the Study of Women and Society at the University of Oregon. Thank you so much for watching.